This episode of the Creep Street Podcast is brought to you by Martini Coffee Roasters. You know, people always look at me weird when I say I start off every morning with a big old martini. But then I set them straight and I tell them I'm talking about Martini Coffee Roasters coffee. A delicious coffee made by the Martini family. They roast their coffee using a traditional method of sight and sound to roast those little babies to perfection. And they also sell green coffee beans for those home roasters out there. And right now, fans of the Creep Street podcast can get 20% off their entire order by using the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Once again, for 20% off your order, use the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Martini Coffee Roasters, the perfect coffee to keep you creeps caffeinated. You've taken a wrong turn. Down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. And you have arrived at episode 201 of the Creep Street Podcast. That is correct, yes. Now, because this is a, uh, a, a volume two of an episode we're in the middle of, we don't have to do a lot to kind yeah. of build up the suspense. But of course, follow us on Facebook, Instagram at Creep Street Podcast, Twitter at Creep Street Pod. We are also on threads. And uh, we also have a TikTok. Go uh, uh, follow that as well. Our uh, Twitter slash X is uh, Creep Street Pod. And, of course, if once a week is not enough for you, folks, you've heard us say it a million times, yeah. we have a Patreon. Yeah. We got goodies for, of all kinds, three different tiers over there. Go find the tier that's right for you, especially now while we're, we are in the middle of a revamp and Maureen's got a book club coming and everything. That's right. And at the end of this episode, I will be announcing the first book of the Creep Street Book Club. So stick around for that, folks, because that is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I mean, last week we gave them, for episode 200. 200. We gave them volume one of Mothman. We finally are doing it. A lot of you guys told us that this was your guess, that you thought 200 was going to be Mothman. And you are correct. Well done. Absolutely. And you know what? I What I liked about volume one was it did a great job of Bringing us right up to the meat and taters. Exactly, exactly. We got the background. We know what what kind of is going on. And we got a little bit of the start. But now we're really going to dive into kind of the aftermath and what happened to these people in this town because of the Mothman and also things that maybe happened that the Mothman warned about, but maybe he was just there. I don't know. We'll see. For my sources, you know, they're the same as last week. Yeah. Um, so I guess you don't need to read them off. You want to, I mean, they are at the beginning there. of episode one. Of course. The main one, though, I will say, of course, The Mothman Prophecies by John Keel. Amen. Of course. Maureen. Should we just dive right in? I guess so, yeah. Well, here you go, everybody. Get your picks. Get your helmets with lights on them. I'm talking about caves and coal miners. I'm not doing a great job. Essentially, what I'm saying is we're going back to West Virginia, and it's time for all of us to gear up and get ready for Mothman Volume 2. So at the end of last episode, we talked about the beginning of Mothman and how at first, you know, these people, have, how they at first saw Mothman. Yeah, yeah. How the flap really began. And flap, for those of you who don't know, a term that pretty much just means an area and a period of time where there are a lot of you know, fill in the blank kind of sightings, whether that's UFOs or ghosts or whatever. And and in this case, it's all of the above. Absolutely, absolutely. Good way to describe it, Maureen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your candor. Now, at the end of last week's episode, we read a quote about how frightening these encounters can be because it's easy to kind of just hear about these stories and, For think, sure. and just think like, 
oh, that's so weird, kind of creepy. Like if I saw that, I'd be creeped out. And it's, it goes into more than that. Because first yeah. of all, you just really got to put yourself in their position and, and like be alone or, or out in the woods or, or even in your home and you see this thing, whatever. That's so horrifying. You're right. And it's not just that. It's also where you are in your life at yeah. that moment. Oh, where yeah. you are emotionally, mentally. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's many things. It's yeah. many things. And also it seems like, and we've mentioned this before, is that with other things, is that it may be like emitting some kind of something or like a vibration or, or I don't know what it is, but that's making you feel super scared. Absolutely. Where it's like, because we've heard about that with other things too, where it's like, I saw this thing and like, it really wasn't that scary, but I was like horrified, like terrified, could not move, was so scared. Right. And then sometimes it's in the other direction where you're like, I'm seeing this thing and I understand it should be really scary, but I'm, I actually was very content. Very true. Yeah. And we hear about that a lot in every case, but especially this, this case. And so anyway, we know how scary this guy can be, Mothman. Absolutely. And being scary doesn't even necessarily mean malevolent. No, we don't know exactly what this guy's deal is. Yeah. Because, like you said, yeah, he's scary, but he hasn't really done anything yet. Well, and as we learned from one of the witnesses, the quotes you read, she felt like he was an empathetic person. Yes. Or an empathetic being. And she did say a little bit about how she felt about him and how she felt bad that he was lonely and she could feel that he was trying to communicate with her. And I said a little bit of, you know, it almost sounds a little romantic. Like it sounds a little bit like a uh, the beginning of a Nicholas Sparks Ooh, book. Oh, okay. All and right. yeah, and we are actually going to cover that a little bit in our Patreon episode this month. There are some great, you know, Reddit content out there about a uh, feeling some kind of way about the Mothman and we're going to read those stories once again Patreon this month. That is for dang sure. And we talked about this a little bit earlier but especially now at this point after Mothman had been seen by multiple people and it was kind of aware people were aware in the town of a Point Pleasant and then the surrounding areas that this was going on that then the UFOs came. Uh oh. Yeah they came in droves and like we said in Appalachia in general, there's all sorts of UFO activity. So there was UFO activity. People had seen UFOs in the area before Mothman. Absolutely, you're right. But this is when it it was really picking up here. This is when it really was, you know, it, right. going for it. And we actually have a quote here from Linda. And Linda was the woman that we really kind of got her account about the first main sighting of Mothman with the two couples in the car. And and she was also the one that said that he like sat on her roof, you know, the Dawson's Creek vibes. Right, right, right. And Linda actually saw a very interesting UFO that is very much worth noting. Because a lot of the UFOs that were seen in Point Pleasant were a lot of UFOs that we've talked about before, kind of like a cigar shape or some, or kind of like more of a classic spaceship shape that we would think of, or maybe right. even maybe even saucers. Right, the cigar shapes, saucer shapes, and I think there's a few others like that are bus kind of, kind of shape. Yeah, that yeah. are kind of your typical UFO, or almost like blimp, like a zeppelin yeah, shape yeah, 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 yeah. in a way. Mm -hmm. Some too. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so there was a lot of that, but this was definitely worth noting because Linda saw some thing that was completely out of the ordinary. Okay. Linda was asked if she thought the UFOs were in any way related to Mothman, and this was her reply. Oh yeah, they were pretty. I saw one that looked like a blooming rose. It was all different colors, like the petals were coming out of it in all directions. And the colors weren't anything like we would have. They were much brighter, simply beautiful. Wow, okay. So I thought that was interesting because I've never heard of a UFO like that ever. Right. It makes me wonder if it even was a UFO. I mean, it technically was a UFO, obviously, right, right. because it was unidentified and it was flying and it was an object. But I mean, like, maybe it wasn't a, a ship or something like that. You know what I mean? Right, Like, right. maybe there was, it just was some other thing. I don't know. Or maybe it was, a, a, a you know, some sort of spacecraft. I, I don't know. Right. Linda, she didn't go into too much detail here, but she did think that the UFO activity was related to Mothman. And a lot of people have said that. And really the main evidence of that is just that after Mothman came, there was a fuck ton of UFOs. 
Now, here is kind of an interesting story that I think is worth, you know, talking about here where it's it, it seems like it's unrelated, but I do think it is related because there was this woman who kept being called in the Point Pleasant area again and again and again asking for this woman named Gwen Stevens. Okay, not now, Gwen Stefani. Not Gwen Stefani. We love her though. This was before, I don't think she was even born yet, bless her. Of that, I would have no doubt. You know what? I'm just a girl, but I think that's great information. Spiderwebs. Okay, so she kept getting these calls, but the woman who, you know, was answering the phone was named Gwen. Yeah. But her last name wasn't, wasn't Stevens, very confused, and eventually got in touch with John Keel about this. Okay. Because weird phone calls come up again and again and again in this case. Yes. And it, sometimes it's you pick up the phone and it's just breathing like a pervert or but maybe it's not a pervert, but it probably is. Sometimes it's just calls with like weird beeping noises on there. And then sometimes it's just like you're just getting like mass called. Isn't there a word for that when you like continuously call someone like someone's blowing up your phone? I mean, someone's blowing you up, blowing up your spot. And yeah. So that happened a lot too. And in this case, it was, you know, someone asking for someone that didn't live there and they continued to call. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, this does happen to me all the time. Someone, I get calls or voicemails about um, people wanting to get their fence fixed. <laughs> okay. And I used to get a lot of calls. Oh, in, they're calling you as if you are a place of business that yes, does that. Yes. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. So it wasn't a company calling about your fence row. No, 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 no. I see. They think I'm here to fix the fence. Ah. Which I've never done. I can try. Yeah. But I wouldn't, you know, you should probably do someone else. And I used to get a bunch of calls um, of people speaking in Mandarin. Couldn't tell you why. Wow. Okay. So, so maybe I'm involved in this. I doubt it. But anyway, so she got in touch with John Keel. And John Keel kind of put some things together and thought that, you know, he knows this UFO expert named Jen Stevens. He was thinking, you know, maybe there was a connection here that these people that are continually calling this woman in West Virginia, it is related somehow to the UFO flap. And, you know, he's just kind of putting things together. And, and it's interesting, too, because you don't know if the people on the phone, are they the government? Are they these men in black? Are they, you know, beings that we don't know of? I, it's unclear. So this UFO expert, Jen Stevens, she lived in upstate New York. And she was one of those people that she also was getting a bunch of phone calls, even though she was, you know, in New York. She kept getting phone calls of just breathing. And, you know, she was really unsure of what was going on. And then sometimes there would be, you know, the, the high pitched bleeps or, or oh. the high beeps that I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. And not a bleep. They're not cutting out someone, you know, like being a little cursing. Not yeah, they're a yeah. beep. Yeah. And then it would just cut out. Almost like how the old dial-up used to sound. Remember yes. the dial-up internet? Of course. We love it. Now, a little bit after that, her husband went into a, a local coffee shop, you know, just getting a coffee. And in the coffee shop, he saw a tall, tan, quote, saturine looking man. And I'm already thinking men in black. Okay. This man, her husband, I'm not sure if he was kind of aware of Men in Black and was aware of, you know, maybe this kind of happening at the time or if at the time he just kind of thought he was sitting next to a kind of a strange guy. I don't know. Yeah. And just so everyone knows, because I only recently had found out what this definition meant. Yeah. Uh, Saturine as an adjective, one could mean born under the influence astrologically of the planet Saturn, but mm -hmm. it can also mean a cold and steady in mood, slow to act or change, of a gloomy or surly disposition or having a sardonic aspect, according to uh, Merriam-Webster. So I'm guessing, okay. so sort of a gloomy, sort of a brooding... Uh, and also kind of calm. Right. I see that with Men in Black. Even uh, though they're like super weird and kind of are like... Yeah. They are, you know, I don't know. I, they're very calm though. They don't, they're not erratic. So these two men, Jen's husband and this mysterious man, they sat next to each other and they talked for a little bit and they started talking about UFOs. And when the husband got up and left, the mysterious man said to him, quote, People who look for UFOs should be very, very careful. So two months after that, the husband suddenly died. He was in his early 30s. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And his wife, Jen, wouldn't go into it with John Keel. She wouldn't go into details, but she did say she knew that it was UFO related. Okay. So don't know the details there. 
even though that is kind of tangential to what we're talking about, I still thought it was worth mentioning because this is reaching far, far out. They're trying to really, what I, I don't, it's like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. You know what I mean? It's like, right. sometimes it seems like some of these beings or, or whatever are trying to shut people up. And that makes you think more so it's like government related. And maybe you're like, okay, maybe the men in black work for the government. But then other times if people are contacted and are encouraged to look for things and engage with these things. And, you yeah. know, so it's just very weird. It's like, it, it's hard to know what, who wants what. It's like, make up your mind. Do you want us to report it or not? And I think, but what I'm, I agree, it's weird. And I think it's two separate groups. Absolutely. And remember last week how we thought it was so strange that Indrid Cold told Darren Berger, Woody Darren Berger, to report I know. his encounter. And that is something that is weird. I completely understand why people, that it makes them not really take it as seriously. I totally get that because it's like, no offense to Woodrow Derenberger. I mean, I'm sure he's a great guy, but it's like, why did Indrid Cold go to him to like spread the word? Like, why didn't he go to, you know, fucking the president? Right. You know, I don't. And that's kind of what we talked about, especially in these rural communities in Appalachia and whatnot. Folks sitting on their high horse in in D.C. Yeah. Don't really, you know, might not take seriously seriously, or whatnot. So you could argue that that's actually the perfect area or to sort of interact with human beings because no one's going to believe them anyway. Right. But that makes like I understand why maybe some activity would be like that because the government would either maybe they they just know that things happen there and it's just a happy accident or maybe they're able to like move the stuff that over there. Yeah. Cause like injured cold, like he's not a part of the government. So I don't know why he would want Woodrow to be kind of like written off. I don't know. It's very weird. It's, it's weird, but I, I, it's very complex. Absolutely. Someone's playing 4d chess. Ex- ex- that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. I'm like, there is more going on Yep. and there's more like, you know, collusion going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. That it's like, it's hard to really know exactly what's happening because like you said, I think there's a whole other aspect that we just don't even know about. Right, that change, correct. That could change everything. Correct. So at this point, there's kind of a very interesting dichotomy going on here with the people of Point Pleasant and in the surrounding area because at this point, a lot of people, they are worried. They're pissed. They're out to go. Like people are literally going out like in, you know, like posses with guns at night going into the woods, like trying to kill Mothman. Right. Now, Circa, where do you think we are in general, like a date here? Obviously, we're not talking about a specific thing at the moment, but where would you guess? Have we entered 1967 yet? I would say at this point, we're kind of, you know, at the end of 66, kind of getting to the top of 67 here. Okay, very cool. Yeah, we're not too far into uh, the sightings and everything quite Absolutely yet. Absolutely, right. So yeah, I think that's why at this point, I think really throughout this whole thing, but especially at the beginning, like I'm saying, people are like, people going out with fucking like torches and pitchforks. Right. Like, it's that kind of vibe, but with guns. And um, it's just good to have an American tradition. Amen. And, and if, if you aren't shooting a gun in, at, in the dark at something you don't know, like, what are you doing? Yeah. So a lot of people were doing that. But then at the same weird time, like, when people would make a report about seeing something, whether that be a UFO or, or Mothman or whatever, like, a lot of people would make fun of them. Oh, of course. But it's weird because, like, what I'm saying is, like, a lot of people were, like, so many people were making these reports. And so many people were, like going out and trying to hunt Mothman. But still, there was like a good chunk of people that just made fun of people that made claims of seeing it. Yeah, it's And not much has changed. However, you know, granted with starting around 2017 when the U.S. government started to actually talk about UFOs in the news and stuff, Mm -hmm. now it's, it's taken a little more seriously no, for sure. I mean, that's it's really a tradition that has not changed. Yeah. And I totally understand that like on that happens on a wider level, of course, where yes. like a lot of people believe but a lot of people don't and kind of make fun of it. Right. I just find it kind of strange that even within Point Pleasant, this was happening. Like yeah. even within a small community and all of this stuff happening. I mean, we will 
you know, talk more about sightings and everything. But I believe like at the end of the day, at the end of our story here, there's going to be, and we're not going to talk about all of them because there's just not enough time, but there were over a hundred different sightings of the Mothman. Yeah. And that's just, and that's, so that means there's more people because it wasn't always just one person that saw him by himself during these reportings. And then also because so many people are getting, you know, made fun of and then other people, they it's just happening so often they don't even really think about it. Like there are a lot of times where it nothing was reported. Of course. So, so many people were seeing this thing and it's just interesting that some people in the town weren't into it. But I, you're right. It's just, it's just natural. But there were people that believed in this whole situation so much that they also were very interested in Woody's relationship with Cold. They wanted to know more about this, this, uh, this bromance, this bromance. Honestly, we love it. Like this is like, like who are two celeb bros? I know. Uh, I mean, Affleck and Damon. Yeah, for sure. I think DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire. Yes. And then you have Andrew and, and Woody. I mean, come on. It's the boys. Yeah. It's a boys weekend. So a lot of people wanted to get in with the boys. That's right. And so they're like, they wanted to either see a ship or they wanted to see Indrid Cold. But by the way, at this point in the book, we just know his last name is Cold. But spoiler alert, his name is Indrid Cold. Because Indrid Cold had told Woody that Indrid was going to come back to, you know, pick him up again and hang. So people wanted to see this. So like very often people would just sit outside of Woody's house and just wait. Right. And one time after everybody left, because it was late at night and people, you know, had to go home to go to bed, wouldn't you believe it? But of course, at that point, Indrid Cold did show up and he talked with Woody for for a little bit. They they kind of hung out. They had a hang. And Woody was saying that he had a stomach ache. So Indrid gave him a vial of medicine. Woody took it and he said that it worked immediately. Hey. Immediately. Wow. You know? And what was the medicine for again? A stomach ache. Hey, I'll take some of that. I mean, my stomach hurts like 90% of the time. Yeah. Hook us up with some of that. Seriously. I, that, I've been searching for this my entire adult life. Yeah. And Woody just got it. Just got it. He just got it. It's so interesting, though, that there. this is more ev- evidence that this other community, this other society, maybe uh, they're clearly uh, ahead of us, at least in many ways. Okay. And to really just, you know, show what, uh, to prove his point, Woody actually checked himself into a mental hospital for examination. Hey. He wanted to prove to everybody that he was of the right mind. That's right. And he was given the all clear. That's right. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't for sure rule out everything, but it's, it's uh, pretty promising. Yeah. So now Mothman had been seen in five different counties. Wow. So it's not just Point Pleasant and kind of the vague surrounding areas. It's a big area at this point. Once right. again, Point Pleasant is kind of the, the hub, but yeah. it, it's it's being seen five counties is big. And, you know, Ohio is, you know, right there. Uh, oh, so that's a right. lot yes. of these sightings are happening in Ohio as well. Um, and it's just, is really picking up here. And there have been more phone calls. But it's interesting, too, because there was at least one case of a woman who could hear either Morse code or radio signals or something like that just in the open without any kind of, you know, not not a phone or anything. She's just walking down the street or she's outside in her yard and she can hear it. Yes, she can hear it. And it's just it was so strange. And she was actually contacted with the people that were working on Project Blue Book. Oh, uh, like J. Allen Hynek and, and, mm-hmm. and among others, uh, the famous uh, ufologist and also professor uh, here in Chicago at, I think it was Northwestern University, where the, he yeah. did the bulk of his, his work as, a, as an educator. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, Project Blue Book, it was a big government project investigating or who knows what, really, with yeah. UFO, alien activity, that kind of thing. So I, she talked to him and gave him, you know, they wanted to hear what she had to say. But the most important part is that when Keel was telling this part of the story, he ended the paragraph by calling her a beautiful, lithe divorcee. 
Oh, wow. Okay, well, that's, you know, what a way to, to describe yeah. a person, especially yeah. a, a witness to, uh, you know, this kind of life-altering thing. And, you know, it, it's just irrelevant. Yeah. And that happens so much in this book. The way he describes men is he doesn't really say much. And then he describes, like, the women, like, their attractiveness and a their body types. Legs. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, this book is, uh, this man was born in the 30s and it shows. Yeah, this was a man of a specific era. I think yeah. the majority of his journalism work was was throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s. So he was a man of an era. Yeah. So just if you read the book, just know that's going to happen and just have fun with it. Yeah. So at this point as well, John Keel wanted to go back to the TNT site, a.k.a. the spot where the four people, the individuals, the two couples in the car saw Mothman. Okay. And a lot of people think that that was kind of his his zone, that he was living in in the TNT site, and there were these igloos, is what they called them, whereas these, these circular or dome-like buildings where yeah. they would previously would hold TNT and all that stuff. And so there was one of these domes that did not have any pigeons living in it or any birds living in it, which all of the other domes did. Really? But for whatever reason, the wildlife just hadn't taken up residence there. And a lot of people think it's because that was where Mothman hung out. Ah. So that was his house. And of course, we can't confirm that, but it's a it's a theory that it a is. lot of people had at the time, and, and some people hold to this day. Interesting, yeah, that, that why would wildlife take up in all of them except right. this, this one, you know? Yeah. Right. So... John Keel was going to go to this TNT site and a few of the witnesses that had seen Mothman were joining him, as well as a journalist from a respected paper over on the Ohio side, on the other side of the river, but still, you know, very close to Point Pleasant. Her name was Mary, and she was very instrumental in all of this work and this research and this investigation. She really was kind of like Keel's right-hand man kind of thing. Right. So she was also joining. And of course, we we can get into more detail possibly in the Patreon or in a follow-up episode if you would like. I can give you more of like the names of everything and specifically who is there. But then there are so many different characters and so many different names in this story that it, it's it's not necessarily important to know every single person's name. Correct. But if you want that, we can supply it. Let us know. Absolutely. So it was John Keel, the reporter Mary, and a few other witnesses that were back at the TNT site. So some of the witnesses that were there decided to go into one of the buildings to investigate. Okay. But not everyone went inside. Some people were inside and some people were outside. But while they were inside, one of the women saw the notorious, the horrifying, glowing red eyes in the darkness. Here we go. And she really, really freaked out and got scared. And and so they all, you know, quickly, quickly got out of that building. And they finally got out of the building and they're talking to the group that was outside and they, they were asking some questions. Then they were kind of confused. The people outside were like, so what happened in there? What what made that big noise? And the people in, that were inside were like, what do you mean? And the outside group, they said that they had heard a big metallic noise and then saw a figure running from the building. Oh. And at first they thought the figure was John Keel for whatever I, for, for whatever reason. I don't really know why he would just be running from the building, but for some reason it, it made sense to them. And that's who they thought it was. But then they realized that John didn't leave the building at that point. He was with the group. Oh. And then the woman who saw the glowing red eyes starts to bleed out of her ear. Okay, wow. So that is also a thing that we, I've heard a few times reading the book, the books, I should say, multiple books about the Mothman, about these sightings, is that oftentimes there'll be bleeding from the ear. There are also other cases of this happening outside of this whole Mothman situation. This ear bleeding situation, it's its scary because it's like, that's not normal. Right. That's not like, you know, a nosebleed, which, you know, of course can mean something larger, but usually it's like not anything to really worry about or, you know, whatever. Right, right. But like your ear bleeding, yeah, that's, it, that's big, scarier. Yeah, I, I would think, and I'm no medical expert, but I would think bleeding out your ears holds a little more weight in terms of, should I be nervous? Yes, exactly. And just a quick note, by the way, I'm looking back at my notes 
notes. And I think I said that the woman who went into the building and saw the glowing red eyes was the one that had the uh, ear bleeding, but it was actually someone outside, one of the women outside that had experienced this very loud metallic noise that had the ear bleeding. So I might, sorry if I misspoke there, my apologies. And the theory, at least that is, was in the book, and I think makes sense, and I, I think probably what was happening, I don't know, maybe, was that the ear bleeding was from a concussion that she experienced because of a change in air pressure. Okay, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, that's a theory that kind of comes up a lot too, is that maybe there are some like ultrasonic waves or something like that related to Mothman and that that maybe that's causes the fear or the paralysis or, you know, it's, it's, we don't know. But she did have a concussion in her, she was bleeding from her ear. Very interesting. Okay. And as we were ending that part and they were leaving the TNT area because one of the women saw this horrifying thing that was the scariest thing she had ever seen in her life and she saw it again in the darkness and then another woman had a concussion and was bleeding from her ear Mm. and John Keel said now we had two hysterical women on our hands (laughs) women be shopping women be shopping and they overreact about everything you know what I mean it's like your ear is bleeding. Put a tampon in it. Like, I don't care. Who is that John Keel or Andrew Dice Clay? Oh, right? we're having fun. Yeah, that's not great. But it's so very interesting that so many things about this story are interesting. The, the fact that this woman's ear started bleeding, the loud noise. Also, the fact that only one person inside the dark building saw these glowing red eyes. Uh, right. Just like how Darren Berger described how cars seemed to just drive by when he was having his encounter, seemingly not to notice this big fucking thing yeah. in the sky above the road. So, yeah. I mean, maybe there's something about that, too, where it's only meant for her. Yeah, so where it's like sometimes you can see it and maybe it's because there's something going on in your brain, like you're able to you're connect, you're, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about specifically, but there's some sort of something going on in there. And once again, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like, you know, she's going crazy and it's a hallucination or whatever. It's like a misfire of her brain. It's more so that like her brain is doing something that's allowing her to see something that is there. You right. know what I mean? Or- or whatever this being is is tapping into. Right, her specifically for some reason. Right, and we've talked about that yeah. a lot in our like haunting stories, how you know people will use like recorders to capture EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon, and how there'll be multiple recorders sitting next to each other, yet for some reason, one will capture something loud and clear that the others don't pick up. Right. It's as if whatever was there was directing its its message directly to one thing. Maybe it's the same way. Maybe it's it was directed to this specific woman. Right, right. And, you know, who knows why? Yeah. It's the, Who knows if it's like the, the fear bong thing that we've thought about where maybe the Mothman gets energy from people being scared and maybe could sense that she would be the one that would get the most scared. Or, or right. maybe it's... Who knows? It could come from so many different things. We're not sure. But a very scary evening, no doubt. Now, like I mentioned before, John Keel said that there are, you know, around 100 reported cases of the Mothman. At this point, I don't think there was the full 100 yet, but there were a lot of sightings. So let's go over what we kind of are saying the Mothman looks like at this point, because it it does change a little bit. Mm. And some of that could be just from uh, time, from memory. We talked about that a little bit in the first episode where eyewitness accounts aren't as reliable as you would think they are. And once again, it's not because someone's lying. It's just because your brain doesn't, for, you know, most people isn't a photographic memory. And and it changes kind of over time uh, subconsciously. Exactly, right. This and, and also just some people think they saw different things. But at this point, this is kind of the main vibe of the Mothman. They were saying that the Mothman was gray, but like a dark gray okay. for the most part. A lot of people were saying that the Mothman takes off upwards like a helicopter. It's not like an airplane where it like kind of like, or a bird, where it like kind of like goes forward and flaps its wings to get forward and upward momentum. Right. And as we know, it seems like the Mothman never even flaps his wings. Yes. Because sometimes birds will literally just jump up from where they are, but they're flapping flapping. their fucking wings. They're flapping. The Mothman almost seems to just kind of take off. like float or something. Yeah. Yeah. So they've noticed that, the upward kind of helicopter-likeness of the whole thing. Makes you wonder, what's with the fucking wings then? Right. Or maybe, does he, yeah, I don't know. Is it part of arrow being aerodynamic? Maybe he does flap and we just haven't seen him flapping? Yeah. I don't know. 
maybe that's just scary to right. see. I, I, you know, I don't know. Also, at the most part at this point, people are not really sure or never really get a clear look at what his face looks like, other than just the red eyes. Mm. Which is very interesting because, once again, that is similar to reports that people make about seeing angels or demons, is that they don't really get a clear look at the face. Right, absolutely. And also, just similarly, and this might be true for other people, I don't really see super clear images of people's faces while I'm dreaming. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I I can see what you mean. You just, because at the same time, you kind of know who it is. I just kind of know. So it's even. Or maybe you don't if it's someone you don't know. Right, right, right. If you're having a dream about a family member or a friend, yeah, you're right. You kind of just know it's them. And then maybe later you realize, oh, I didn't really even look. Yeah. Like I have been aware sometimes when I've been dreaming and I've kind of thought, like, huh, I don't, this person doesn't really have a face. And not like in a creepy way where it's like there's just flesh over where the face should be. It's just like, I'm just not really seeing it. So I don't know, maybe there's some sort of connection there with the brain activity or or something, or maybe it's just a coincidence, I don't know. Now, already, as we've said before, crazy stuff going on in town. Right. But now is really the beginning of a, of outside things coming in that, that are interesting, similar to Men in Black, but not always Men in Black. For example, There was a blonde woman in her 30s who was going around to many different witnesses and she was asking them all sorts of questions. And she told everyone that she was John Keel's secretary. I think we've talked about this maybe in our Men in Black episode. Yeah. We mentioned this because this was kind of interesting. It's like a, a woman in black. Yes, but she has, as far as I could tell, at least through my the, my research, she didn't really look like a Men in Black per se. Like she didn't right. have the kind of like long fingers and kind of like weirdish look. And But this woman had blonde hair and was just more normal. She didn't really give off that kind of weird, weird vibe. And she asked these witnesses to fill out these like really long, complicated forms about all sorts of things in their life, like about their health, their income, what car they have, family background, and also questions specifically about UFOs. And it happened time and time again when Keel would, you know, go to someone and ask them a question or something. And they'd be like, I already told your secretary about this. And he, you know, had no idea who that person was. And as far as I know, until John Keel died, he had no idea who that woman was. Very interesting. Yeah. My guess is maybe some sort of government, I mean, who knows? I'm just throwing stuff, but maybe some sort of government agent who was just kind of sent along to just kind of snoot, just see what he's doing, what Keel is doing. Maybe not anyone supernatural or or extraterrestrial, but just someone who was kind of sent to kind of just check the temperature. Yeah. Make make sure Keel's not getting too out of hand. Yeah, I could totally see that. But at the same time, these experiences that happen are very strange because they ask questions that, that, that just seem strange strange even for that like wanting to know all sorts of like every type of car they've ever owned yeah or every school they've ever been to mm. the school they a lot they, it didn't mention specifically in this instance but so many times in these weird interviews that that witnesses have given to either you know someone like this like a normal seeming woman or a weird man in black that they want to know so much about school. Like they want to know so much about where they went to school and where their kids go to school and, and things like that. So it's it's very, I don't know, hmm. it's weird. Sounds kind of elitist. Honestly, it's like, okay, sorry I didn't go to Exeter. Yeah. You fuck. Anyway, and at this time, concurrently with all of this kookiness, of course, there's also just other weird activity. There's lots of poltergeist activity going on in people's homes. Mm. Home People that had seen the Mothman and people that had not seen the Mothman or UFOs or anything. And that's not new. I mean, look at Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. We, that's one we kind of, it's kind of a common denominator mm-hmm. we always mention is how much was going on. I mean, do you even quantify Skinwalker Ranch as a UFO story? It's a little of everything. There was right. cryptids there. There was shit going on in the house that was like poltergeist. Mm-hmm. If it was haunt. It was, I was, I've been thinking that too and I'm glad you brought it up because I've been meaning to, is that, yeah, this case, the Mothman case and the Skinwalker Ranch case are so similar to me. Yeah. Even though there was no, like, one specific, like, being in particular at Skinwalker Ranch like there is here, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like everything is happening. Right, absolutely. 
There was also a lot of sightings of glowing orbs. We've heard a lot about that. Heard a lot about that. And there's also a lot of accounts of babies crying. Yeah. Now, that's something, remember, in High Strangers in Appalachia, Mm -hmm. we heard about the sound of babies crying in the woods. Yeah. Perhaps to maybe draw. Yeah, lure you in. Lure you in, because obviously when you hear a baby crying, especially out in the woods, your instinct is to rush to help it. Right. And so people who live in Appalachia say, when you hear that, call the authorities rather than trying to rush in in there yourself. Yeah, and that is actually just for paranormal reasons is very scary and important to do, but also just sidebar. It's also really important to do that too because a lot of like um, murderers or kidnappers or, you know, motherfuckers, psychos, they'll do stuff like that. Or they'll like be on the side of the road and and making it seem like there's like something really wrong with either them or their car or something. Right, right. That's another case. Don't do that. Anyway, completely sidebar, but just wanted to say it because it came up. But the baby's crying was weird too because it wasn't just happening out in the wilderness where we heard about it, the high strangeness in Appalachia. And also I think it's talked about too in Hellier, you know, the series we are always talking about. But people were saying that they were hearing babies crying inside their home even when there were no babies there. Now that's freaky. That is freaky. That is horrifying. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, it just makes no sense. Absolutely. That is truly creepy. Yeah. And something that was pointed out in the book, too, is that a lot of this activity in these sightings tend to happen in lovers' lanes. Oh, yeah, where people kind of go to, to hook, to hook up, up and stuff. That's a great point. There's, yeah. Yeah, there, maybe there's something about that, too, about that energy, how we say a shadow person thrives off of fear and negative energy. Yeah. I mean, I would assume, I mean, gosh, you would think there's beings that feed off of... Mm-hmm. Not even just sexual energy, but just feelings of love, feelings yeah, just of like happiness. positive, maybe. More yeah, feelings. Po- positivity. I mean, yeah, who knows? It would make sense, I would think. Like, yeah. I mean, a, a lunch is lunch, you know what I mean? I mean, come on. And I mean, there are a lot of, I don't know too much about it. We'll have to really dive into this in uh, later episodes, especially with like uh, Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley and stuff. But there is a lot of, say, a, a lot of people think that uh, with magic, there's a lot of sex magic. They think that, you know, yes. there's a lot of power that comes from cum and orgasms and all of the above. I think sex magic will be a great episode and we need to do that. Yeah. I think that sounds very interesting. You know... Gonna have to look up a lot of video references. Oh, come on. That episode will either be really fun or incredibly awkward. Oh, yeah. And there's no way to know until we try. Stay tuned. But uh, what was pointed out to me, too, just to kind of going off the lover's lane thing, is that fairies... And I actually, I think I mentioned this last episode, that fairies are often mentioned or talked about really wanting to set up humans. Like, they want to set up some kind of, like, love or something like that. Mm. It happens a lot in uh, Shakespeare and in lots of other literary texts as well as like folklore and, and everything that that's what fairies are trying to do. And maybe that has something to do with it. They, well, they want, they need that energy. Shout out to episode two to Dave Huggins. Of course. Um, him and his love affair with the extraterrestrial known as Crescent. Mm. I mean, a steamy affair. A steamy affair. Check it out for an yes. early episode. Please. And I also think it's worth mentioning, and this is probably a coincidence, but worth mentioning, that a ton of serial killers are active in lovers' lanes. Yeah, that would make, I mean, yeah, that's very interesting. I think it's probably more of just a coincidence because a lot of people are kind of like alone and secluded and it's just easier to like abduct or kill someone. Right, and you're in a vulner- more of vo- you yeah. know, a vulnerable state. Right, but I just think it's interesting that it's like, so many things that we cover kind of come together in, in, you know, cars and lovers' lanes. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. And of course, with serial killers, sometimes there is a sexual component to yes, their- a darker their kind of, yeah. Maliciousness, mm-hmm. yeah. So I don't know, who knows? And of course, there was a lot of other, you know, more intense, spooky, weird activity, including cattle mutilation. You heard, you knew it was coming. It's a staple, unfortunately, yeah. poor yeah. cows. And I sadly, I don't, I don't remember for sure, but I think it was also other animals like goats and, you know, all sorts of animals. I don't think it was like dogs or anything like that. I could be wrong, but it was mainly farm am- animals. Not to say that we don't care. Of oh, of course. course. But just, it's, you know. it's, all, it's just, it just sucks. That's always the worst, you know, obviously outside of like when you're, you know, we're researching serial killers and all the nasty things they do. But, you know, that's one of the bummers about UFO research is the descriptions of what happens to these animals. Often it revolves around the ass. I know it does. 
Like it, it does. sucks out, like sucks their innards out their ass. In some cases, not right. every. No, no, no. It's true. Or a lot of times, it's like they people who you know the farmers or ranchers or whatever they'll find their their cattle or their cows and like they won't have any more. Like you know, there's no blood, but then there's also no butthole. There's no like genitals and eyes. Yeah, are like big ones, and you're like, why are you taking that? Balls, butt, and eyes. Like, what is it? It's. BBEs. They BBEs. Want, they want the BBE. They want the balls, butt, and eyes. And honestly, I like a good I like a good butt. I like a good set of eyes and a set of balls. So I get it. Yeah. But I'm not trying to cut it off. I'm not trying to take them with me. Right. I want to, you know what I mean, enjoy them as they are. Exactly. And so this was happening all over. It was happening a lot and to, to many different people. And one woman actually saw it happening. Which is incredibly rare. Yeah, that's something I, 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 maybe I've encountered that in some of our research, but yeah, that's this um, might be the first time I've heard of it. I think th- as maybe far I as I wrong. know, that yeah, where th- they saw the mutilation of an animal happen. Wow. Yeah, I, I could be remembering this, this wrong. I think it was even maybe during the day that it was happening, which is strange. It was maybe at night, but this woman though, she did see these two men or men looking things or whatever. They were wearing like checkered shirts and I think like white like coveralls. Okay. And yeah, they were taking this, they, they're mutilating a cow, a cow. And she, you know, like was yelling and kind of ran out to them and they started running and jumped and just kind of disappeared. Oh shit, grab the balls. Oh, you need the balls. So very strange that she actually saw something. And there was also some other, you know, kind of weird animal activity. Like we said, a lot of dogs running away, which is very sad. There's also, I didn't even really mention it at the beginning because I personally don't really know if it, if it means much. Some people think it does. There was like a, unfor- sadly, a, a dead dog on the side of the road when someone saw it and then they saw the Mothman and then they were like heading back to the authorities or s- something like that. And then the, the dead dog was gone. And so some people think that maybe like the Mothman, you know, either ate the dog or like, you know, re- revived the dog and was then like friends with the dog or something. I didn't really mention it because who, goddamn knows i shouldn't I, I but i mentioned it now so you know whatever but it's it's just a like, weird weird animal activity but there was also these huge quote-unquote dog tracks that were found around uh, everywhere and sometimes they were around mothman sightings but then sometimes they were just seen kind of around other paranormal activity and the reason i said quote-unquote dog is because there's no way it could be a dog because the size of the paw print and then also like how deep down the paw print would go oh okay so it's, it seems that it, it's heavier than even a dog would be even a wolf you know it's it, so it's like this massive animal that seems to have dog like paw prints no one actually has seen the animal as far as i was able to tell but these tracks were seen and apparently this happens elsewhere too with paranormal activity not just in point pleasant almost like hell how Maybe, yeah. Right, that's been that was another one you yes. you researched. Very oh, interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. And it wasn't just strange kind of animal activity though, of course, as we know. It's been a lot. And as I mentioned before about the thing about these strange interviewers asking people about the schools they've been to or, you know, their children's schools or whatever. It's interesting because there was a lot of paranormal activity happening near schools and a lot of these sightings were had or made by kids and teachers. So there's something about like learning or, or like, yeah, maybe expanding your mind that kind of attracts this energy or something like that. I don't know. Right, right. So I just thought that was interesting. And then of course there's the scary, weird men in black activity. And there's a lot of thoughts and interpretations and theories about men in black in general, but especially here. And some of the questions are like, why are they always in Cadillacs? They're always in black Cadillacs. They, I mean, I mean, we love a caddy. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, that is interesting. Well, that was something we talked about in the Grinning Man episode was Indrid was always riding around in like a damn caddy with, mm-hmm. you know, rolling a few men deep with yeah. some men in black and stuff. Like when he would mm-hmm. go and visit Darren Burger again and stuff like that. It was He was always rolling in a caddy. Yeah, I think I saw one, and I, it stood out to me that it said a VW. 
VW, like a Volkswagen, yeah. like one time with Indrid. But most of the time, like these men in black and even just like others, like Indrid Cold, who's not a men in black. Yeah, it's these black Cadillacs. And they also were described as being old for the time. Like they were, you know, I, I can't remember the exact year, but you know, substantially old. Indrid Cold might be from Lanulos, but he buys American when it comes to wheels. You oh, yeah. He, oh, yeah. He wants some of that Detroit muscle when he's getting around. Come on. Yes. And That's he deserves it. But there's also something else weird about cars that I've noticed is that a lot of people have mentioned that when they see the men in black, like they arrive at their home, there is no car. And they're kind of like, how did they get here? You know, because a lot of these people live very far out, very rural, and it's cold. Winter for a lot of this. I mean, some of it, of course, is not winter, but a lot of the time it's cold. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, especially what we're leading up to with the Silver Bridge. I mean, it was right before the, it was, it was essentially the holiday season. It was right. December and and. We'll get into that, but yeah, so I mean, yeah, very cold. Right, and when we started this saga, it was uh, November, so, you know, get, it's cold as well. And the, yeah. yeah. So they, that was always strange to people, and then they noticed that when a man in black would leave their home, it would walk towards the road, and then, like, seemingly out of nowhere, one of these Cadillacs would just pull up, and right. they would get in the car. Right, right. And it reminded me a lot of black-eyed kids. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because that is another thing that is mentioned about them not dressing appropriately for the weather. And also that they just are there. Like they're, you know, they can just show up in places without a car, without a bike, without anything, that it would be incredibly hard for them to just get to. Yeah, for sure. So it's just a, a little connection there that I, I thought was interesting. And a lot of people think that in this case and many other cases that the men in black are either there to investigate and try to kind of hush everything up mm -hmm. or they're there as a distraction from what's going on. Like oh, right. the men in black are there to distract people from the weirdness of Mothman. I like a lot of people think that, but I think that's weird. Like, I don't really get that. Like that would make me just more aware of all the weirdness going on. Yeah. I wouldn't just be like, oh, the men in black are here. I'm only going to focus on that. I would just think everything was weird. Unless you know? the goal is to taint the waters with more absurdity. Like you have this yeah, one guess. wild thing that really happened that's yeah. unexplainable. And if that's something if there was some organization or whatnot that wanted to keep this under wraps, you yeah. might introduce some more absurdity as a way of poisoning the well. We've talked mm -hmm. about that, you know, in other things. There's theories that, like, in the UFO world that, you know, there's many things that are real, but then maybe things are, there are some things that are intentionally introduced or or whatnot mm -hmm. that are with the intention, they're disinformation agents or yeah. agents of misinformation, essentially. Yeah. They come in to muddy the waters. Mm -hmm. So you can never quite tell what is real, what is not. And that's right. where it gets dangerous. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I mean? With anything, whether it's the, you know, the news, real, you know, it's, yeah, yeah it's where it gets, you know, weird. So it's a, it's a very interesting topic and it, it, a lot of different theories about who the men in black are, what their purpose is and, and what is going on. But another question about them that I didn't at least know about until this story, but maybe I, I just missed it, is that why are they always trying to get to kids? There have been a few instances in this book about these men in black wanting to talk to or even abduct children. Hmm. There is a um, grown woman named Connie who said that she was very much, men in black really came after her and they were trying to abduct her and she got away. But there's a really scary and, and weird story to me here about a baby that was almost taken by men in black. That's that's like, uh, obviously the first thing your mind goes to is like, you know, the abduction of children, which is oh. an awful and very real thing. And, and, you know, you hear about trafficking and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So obviously you're, I think hearing that your head automatically goes to that and who knows, maybe it also has something to do with, you know how we say it seems, especially in supernatural cases, children seem to have a, they are more open to things. They're right. more susceptible to supernatural occurrences. Maybe right. it has something to do with that. Who knows? But yeah, it does actually up the ick factor, the ickiness. Yes. Of it, these creepy yeah. fucking, yeah, it, it ups the creep factor. Screw these guys. Truly. 
So there was a specific case here involving the attempted abduction of a child that is like, it's just so weird. It's very scary. And I'm going to tell you about it right now. It was from Linda, the same woman we were talking about before. This is from an interview with her. And at first, I'm just going to say a little bit about what she thought about men in black and how she described them. And then I will go into her story. The MIB wore black suits, black hats, and sunglasses. They drove black cars, Cadillacs, I think. I'm not sure about the make and model of the cars. One of the cars would follow us around. There were three men in the car. The police were all involved with the Mothman. Their attention wasn't on the MIB. At least that's how it seemed. I don't know if anyone even ever mentioned the MIB to the police. Everyone was so afraid of them. They looked like human beings, but their skin was somewhat transparent. You could see the veins in their hands very clearly. Their fingers were longer than normal person's fingers as well. We had to keep a crucifix over Danny's bed. For some reason, the MIB were afraid of a crucifix. John Keel thought that these MIB were here after the babies because they were especially intelligent. One of the men came into my bedroom one night. Me, my aunt, and Danny, her baby, were all sleeping in the same room. My aunt had a dream that was exactly what happened in the room while she was asleep. Danny was in the baby bed, right beside my bed. We had a crucifix at the foot of Danny's bed. Mr. Keel said that there had to be gold on the crucifix, so that's what we got. At about midnight that night, a man walked into the room. We had the kitchen light on because the baby was in the room, so we could easily get to her quickly if we needed to. The kitchen was right off the bedroom, so the light flooded into the bedroom a little. The man had coal black hair and wore black pants and a white checkered shirt. He had a crew cut haircut that was about an inch long, sticking straight up. He had dark eyes. He didn't look like the men in the suits. His skin wasn't as transparent as theirs was. The light was dim coming in from the kitchen, but I could see him well enough. He just stood there and stared at me, never blinking his eyes once. After a few minutes, he took a cigarette out of his shirt pocket and lit it. When he did that, the gold crucifix reflected the light and caught his eye. He turned to look at it, as I did. When I turned back, he was gone. No sounds at all. I walked into the kitchen and sat down for a while. When my aunt woke up, she was in the kitchen and said she just had a wild dream. She described exactly what happened in the room a few minutes before. It was very scary. I think that they were there to take Danny that night. And if it wasn't for that crucifix shining when he lit his cigarette, they may have gotten her. Once again, we touched on this a bit in, I think, volume one. The crucifix just introduces a whole new thing about this. Yes. Like, because you associate that, I mean, as a repellent to malevolent spirits, demonic mm-hmm. spirits. Mm-hmm. Now, even if these men in black are, you know, if their intentions are evil, mm-hmm. we, we kind of haven't yet considered them as demonic. We've considered them as being maybe half-human, uh, extraterrestrial yeah. hybrid or, or something of the like, mm-hmm. but not as like a demonic creature, but there's these smells. Uh, mm-hmm. We mentioned in the last one, that sulfuric rotten egg smell. Yep. I don't know what to make of this. It, it is very weird. Especially the whole thing about it being a gold crucifix. Yes. Like, I'm just so fascinated. Why, why, why? is this suddenly, yeah. this ingredient suddenly being introduced? It's so interesting. Like, I don't know why it would affect them. And, and, and so deeply. And also it's like, I can't believe that this man just entered the person's room and was just staring at them. And ugh. and there are other accounts of this happening too. This, this woman, Linda, who we just, you know, we were reading her quote. She was saying that she had a group of friends, I think four of them, that they all got pregnant at the same time. Right. And she also made it very clear that they didn't get, you know, impregnated by aliens. Because I guess a lot of people ask her that. Right, of course. But apparently these other babies, you know, those families, they had similar experiences as well about their babies possibly being tried, like, you know, with attempted abduction. Wow. So, I, yeah, it's weird. I, I really want to know more about this uh, crucifix situation. Absolutely. And these people that were experiencing these things, whether it was men in black, whether it was UFOs, whether it was these bright lights, orbs, men in black, whatever, 
afterwards, a lot of them had a very real physical reaction to these things. Right, right. Well, of course, there was the emotional and mental reactions of extreme stress and terror and, and anxiety that, you know, was horrible, of course. Right. But, you know, the physical aspects were bad, too. A lot of people would get this really intense terrible like eye burn like like there was something with these bright lights that they would see would really deeply affect their eyes and even like burn their skin yeah there was um and they actually mentioned that in the i think 2002 is when it came out that the 2002 film with richard Gere, the mothman prophecies mm -hmm. is the this almost like the light is so bright whether it's like a radiation or something but um yeah, it, it, it almost, there's like a burning like around the eyes. At least that's how they depict it in the film. Right. Um, so interesting that that was also recorded in the, the actual story. Yeah, it's weird. And apparently it's also a thing that has come up again in, in many other UFO stories. And I'm not sure I could be thinking of this incorrectly. I, you know, was listening to some podcasts about the Manhattan Project recently. Yeah. And we'll, of course, do a big old series on that, you know, in the future. But I also remember similar accounts of people who... Not just people who experienced, you know, the horrors of extreme radiation from the atomic bomb dropping. Of course, there was that. But also the people that were working on the bomb. Yeah. And were there for some preliminary test drops, you know, out in the desert. Right. And there was also some recordings of things like that happening. So it makes you wonder, maybe there's some sort of nuclear atomic situation happening. Yeah, that's I don't know. very fascinating. And I just don't know, yeah, what that would mean. There's so many ingredients being added now between crucifixes and mm -hmm. possible like radiation burns. It's, it's, there's so many ingredients. As we said, the Mothman in yeah. some ways is the center of it all. It's crazy. It's yeah. Wild! It is so wild. Another thing that's weird, this would happen to men when they, you know, experienced any of this, but especially the ones that really had a UFO encounter. And this happens outside of Mothman too, but it's called the cosmic clap. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming in reference to the... To good old gonorrhea. To good old gonorrhea. Okay. The cosmic clap. I like the sound of that. Oh yeah. I know. It kind of sounds like, like a treat. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, I'll have two scoops of the cosmic clap. Yeah. But, um, but no, it's gonorrhea. And yeah, but it was it was uh, like temporary gonorrhea that would just go away on its own without, you know, medicine or whatever. Oh, wow. That And that happens to a lot of men. And after these encounters? Yeah. Wow. Isn't that weird? Very interesting. And I don't think it's always like, you know, they had sex with an alien or whatever. It's just they were like around this and they experienced that. It affected the balls and the eyes, the balls, butt, and eyes. We love this stuff. It's very, very weird. I mean, not necessarily the ball, but you know you what know, I'm saying. The, the genital, whole, the, the, the whole vibe. The area, the you zone. know. Now, another thing that ties into other cases and, and other things of the weird that we cover is that a lot of people, after they had encounters with UFOs or aliens, I think it happened in lots of cases in, when they were seeing things in Point Pleasant, very kind of tangentially or whatever, but this really especially happened to anyone that said that they had an, an encounter with someone. There wasn't much of this in, in this story, but in other stories too about actual, you know, abduction and going onto a, a spacecraft of, of some kind. Right, right. But it's that there is some kind of mark on them, like a rash or a burn or just a, a, a tiny little like needle poke. Or, there's yeah. always just kind of, there's often just weird marks. And it's funny because it reminds me a lot of the devil's marks that was always looked for and talked about during witch hunts. Oh, you're right. That's an excellent point. I had not thought of that. You're right. Yes, they would always search all over the person's body to try to find any kind of anomaly and say that that was the witch's mark, which was, it's like gross. It's like a, like a little like nipple that they're like, familiar, you know, drinks out of, I right. think is the idea, but they would take anything as the devil's mark, you yeah, know, right. during Salem, and I'm sure other witch trials too, but yeah, anything from like just a weird kind of mole to uh, an ingrown hair to anything. Right, So they right. were really, you know, being a little crazy about it, but it does make you think like maybe sometimes there was like a weird mark or something. Right. Well, didn't we know. talk about, I think in our episode, maybe our Men in Black episode, there's even theories that like um, 
you know, going back to colonial times and when during the era of these these witch hunts, uh, the the accused or, or whomever involved would mention a, encountering this man in black. Yeah. Who, you know, almost like a, like in the witch, the uh, mm-hmm. black Philip, which is the goat. But then you you sort of see the the outline of this mm-hmm. you know figure at the end, and you know maybe is that the same people? They just operated in a different way. Mm-hmm. That was in accordance with the times, right? They, they, yeah, they made themselves appear, yeah, in a certain way, right? Like you said, that were fit for the time. So it's just interesting, you know. I, I'm not sure. Now we're gonna move ahead here, but I just want to do a quick Indrid Cold check-in. In March of 1967, Woody went back onto Indrid Cold's ship, and he said that he went to Brazil and back in one night. And then he said later he went back on the ship and he he went to Lanulos, the planet where Indrid Cold is from, and he saw a lot of people running around, jogging, either nude or close to nude. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. And there was actually a couple, at least one other case of someone saying that they got onto a craft and actually went somewhere wow. with someone. And, and it's actually so, uh, another guy, he said he went with Vadig or Vedig to Lanulos as well, had a very similar encounter with Indrid Cold. Mm. We might have mentioned that. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's been a while. Episodes. Yeah. So we're definitely going to have to do at some point another check-in with the Grinning Man slash Indrid Cold to really get you know down and dirty in all of these details because – there's so much rich stuff after this because, you know, Woodrow Derenberger's family also said that they met Indrid Cold and his family. Yeah. And there was, you know, regular contact between the two families for a, a very long time. It's interesting. Did did Indrid Cold ever mention Mothman? Did, like, it's interesting yeah. that Indrid Cold is so closely associated with Mothman. Mm-hmm. I mean, are we? Is he the Bruce Wayne to Mothman's Batman? I mean, I get more of the feeling that it's like. I mean, that that's definitely possible. I guess I get more of the feeling that it's more so that they are able to maybe contact us the same way and so maybe for some reason they were able to at the same time and so they even though they're not the same they just manifested or appeared at the same time yes i don't know because as far as i know i don't think as far as i know i don't think injured cold ever or rarely you know brings up the mothman you're right right it's weird and there are other claims of people seeing other spacecrafts like someone saw just like a craft floating or hovering on the side of the road right and that really you know was a lot for them to handle um one woman said that she actually saw a craft before this all happened in november but before mothman was sighted And she said she saw this craft and that two people got out of the craft or, you know, they looked like people. And she described them pretty similarly to Men in Black. And they were asking a lot of questions. This is this woman's account of what she experienced before the Mothman really truly arrived in Point Pleasant. Last November, I think it was the second or the third, I was out behind the building getting ready to go home. It was seven or eight o'clock. Suddenly, there was a little flash, like a camera flash gun going off, directly above me. And then I saw a thing. Some kind of flying machine. I I, I couldn't move. I guess I was frozen with fright. This thing landed right in the parking lot, not 20 feet away from me. It was like a big cylinder. Anyway, it, it didn't make the slightest bit of noise. It just drifted down and then stopped. Like I said, I couldn't move. I guess I started praying. Then two men came out of it, and they walked over to me. They were just like normal-sized, normal-looking men, but their skin was a funny color. Dark. Like maybe they were heavily tanned. The light was pretty bad there, so I couldn't see them all that well. It was all pretty silly. They just wanted to know my name, where I was from, and what I did for a living, things like that. Sometimes it was hard to understand them. Their voices were sort of sing-songy and high-pitched. It was like listening to a phonograph record played at the wrong speed. And they kept asking me for the time. They asked, what is your time, two or three times. Finally, they just walked back to the thing and it took off. Then I could move again. I was scared out of my wits, but I decided not to tell anyone. 
Then a couple of days later, I heard about a man up near Parksburg who had the same thing happen to him. And I saw them again. I saw them in broad daylight, walking right down the main street in Galapolis. This time they were dressed in normal clothes. They looked like anybody. They sort of nodded to me when they passed. I got scared all over again, real scared. That's when I went to the police and told them what I saw. They laughed at me and said I was probably just imagining things. You see, I've been to the police before, about my cattle rustlers. I guess they think I'm some kind of nut. I went to the FBI too. They came out to my place, but they said they couldn't find anything. After that, somebody tapped my telephone. Maybe it was the FBI. So yeah. Wow. Some weird, weird stuff there going on with these encounters. The web just keeps getting more complex. Mm -hmm. It really does. Yeah. I, I just, it's wild. I just don't know what to make of it all. I know. I don't really get it either. It's just, it's so interesting because sometimes they connect and sometimes they don't. Like, I think these men in black, I get the feeling that the men in black are, you know, malevolent and Indrid Cold is benevolent or at least, you know, neutral. Right, That's kind exactly. of the feeling that I get, and they're not connected to each other. Right, right. So that's kind of the last Indrid moment. I just wanted to have an Indrid check-in before we, we continued on. And once again, we'll, we will check back in with Indrid in, in future episodes. Of, of course. course. And now, unfortunately, we're getting pretty close to December of 1967. Yes. John Keel was actually told in an anonymous phone call that there was going to be a disaster in the area of the Ohio River. And through these anonymous calls and even letters too, I'm, I'm remembering he got, it was kind of insinuated, or at least John Keel inferred, that it was going to be some kind of factory explosion. Okay, okay. I mean, that's that's interesting that, that, that he would, inf you know what I mean, especially with the old... TNT. Yeah, exactly. You know, domes and everything. Okay, I, I can see that. A lot of factories in the area. It's, it's, you know, I understand how he could get that impression. And, of course, I believe this happened maybe when he was on the way to Point Pleasant or or I can't remember exactly, but he, he did try to warn people, but there was only so much he could do because he didn't actually know yeah, right. what was going to happen. How do you warn people about something you, you don't even really understand yet? Yeah. 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 Right. And it's also, he doesn't even know who's really giving him this information as well. Right. So he right. doesn't even know if it's real, like, you know, it's a whole thing. So, but he was told that there was going to be some kind of disaster. Now, very, very sadly and tragically, 13 months to the day of the first Mothman sighting, the first true Mothman sighting, yeah. the Silver Bridge collapsed. Yes. And this was a bridge in Point Pleasant that was used constantly. It went over the Ohio River into Ohio. It's like one side of the bridge, it's Ohio. The other side of the bridge, it's West Virginia. And people went back and forth between there all the time. You know, some school friends lived over on the opposite side or, you know, we had to run errands on the opposite side. You know, right? People, it was used all the time. It was like a main thoroughway between, you know what I mean? People used it all the time, whether commuting for work, going home. I mean, it's, yeah, of course. Right. This bridge was made in 1928. And it was known for being like an engineering marvel of its day. Oh, really? Okay. This isn't quite to like Titanic level of being like, this is this ship is unsinkable er, and then right. it's sunk. Not quite to that level, but you know, they it was touted to be a great bridge. Right. But the problem was that this bridge was designed for travel in 1928. It was not designed for the much heavier cars of the 60s. Absolutely. Then you got you think you got trucks that are oh, shipping yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Lots of people going back all the time. I mean, constantly. Right. So apparently the bridge was shaking, but people said that it always kind of did, which is, you know, that's not good. Let's stop that. Right. But, you know, I guess that was just, they were just used to it and didn't really think of anything of it. At this time, there was a traffic jam. There were a ton of people on the bridge. It was, you know, pretty much stop and go traffic. Right. And it was especially bad because of the holiday season. Yes, there was people, obviously, besides just commuting home and mm -hmm. from work and stuff, a lot of people had gifts loaded up in their cars. They had they yeah. were doing their holiday shopping because what was the specific day in December? December 15th. I mean, that is peak, you know, at least yeah. from a consumer standpoint, oh, yeah. peak holiday shopping. 
you know, by that time, the decorations are up. People are feeling the holiday spirit. I, mm-hmm. I, it, it's just like it kind of just paints the tragedy in a way. It, it, it's so sad. Yeah. And, on top of all, I don't know. It just adds a layer of sadness on yeah, top of it because it's like the dichotomy of the of what it is. It's like the uh, the happiest time of the year, and then this horrible thing is happening at the same time. And then it was five oh four p.m. rush hour when suddenly there was a huge, insanely loud metallic sound. Mm-hmm. People started kind of looking around, not really knowing what that was, what that huge noise was. And very horrifyingly, suddenly, 50 cars plummeted into the Ohio River. Some of them sunk right down to the bottom, and some of them were crushed by the steel of the bridge that was also collapsing and falling down. Some people were able to, you know, swim out of their cars. Some of them, you know, if they were able to have a window open or a door open, you know, miraculously, they were able to swim out. Many people were stuck in their cars. Some people were able to get out of their car, but, you know, they couldn't make it for a a multiple, you know, number of reasons. One being, it's tough to say, but some people were crushed to death by the, the steel of the bridge. Absolutely. Also, the water was very cold. Oh, I mean, yeah. it, it is December. Yeah. So that will, that'll shock you. That'll... And it, it's really hard to swim when you are plunged into incredibly cold water right away. And people on the sides of the, that weren't, you know, on the bridge yet, they were kind of waiting to get on the bridge, as well as just people that were nearby were screaming and looking for loved ones and trying to help people get out. And, you know, eventually police were arriving and fire trucks were arriving and trying to save as many people as possible. And a part of the horror and what really made this so hard to to really digest or look at too, which is just that there were a lot of wrapped Christmas presents just floating in the water around all of this. Yeah, it just adds to the, it's like a portrait almost, uh, and it just adds to the sadness of it. Yeah. That this happened during a time of, traditionally, a time of, of joy and whatnot, and, and it just, yeah, the dichotomy of this tragedy, and then these wraps, these beautifully wrapped gifts floating mm-hmm. in the water. It's it's very, it's, it's very sad. It- so many people were, of course, trying to get in touch with, with loved ones to make sure that they were okay. You know, of course, this is before cell phones or anything. So some people didn't know where their, you know, spouse was or their kids were or parents were or anything like that. Like they could have been on the bridge. They, you know, they take the bridge sometimes. They just, they could be concerned that they were maybe on the bridge. Maybe they weren't. Yeah, it was just hard to know who was, who was affected and and who wasn't. And it was just absolute chaos going on in the town. And in the book, John Keel is just describing the horror of, of the scene and how sad it was that these people who, who are just tragically passing away and and those injured, and it's just, he's going into it. And, you know, he's talking about his friend, Mary Heyer, the, the, really his partner in crime, the, the, the journalist at the, uh, the Athens newspaper in Ohio that just was there with him. And she was so strong and covering this story. And then when he's talking about her when she's leaving the building, he says, quote, Mary Heyer wrapped her coat around her pudgy frame. That's, okay. Yeah. That's maybe uh, you could think of a different adjective, maybe. Or just is at the time. Is oh, at the boy. time. And that w- he dedicated the book to her, so that's tough. Now, as far as I know, 38 bodies were recovered from the Ohio River, but unfortunately many more were still missing and were not able to be found. There were 46 deaths all together. Horrifying. And the, I hate to say it, but you know, the, all sorts of people were there. I mean, the, a lot of kids were there. And, yes. you know, we're, we're killed by this. And it's yeah. just it's just a, a, a disaster for a small community like this that I'm sure just was shocking. Yeah. Beyond, you know, to say the least. The bridge collapsed, though, after, you know, a investigation. It was said that it, it collapsed from metal fatigue and structural failure, which makes sense. Essentially, it's just it couldn't handle the weight. Yeah. And it, things broke, essentially, right. is what that means. But there was an interesting sighting by a woman who lived right by the bridge. And she said two days before the bridge collapsed, 
she saw two men climbing on the bridge, wearing checkered shirts. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's one of the things that made people think that maybe there was some kind of nefarious reason for this happening. Like as if this thing was purposely rigged to, yeah. to you know, collapse. Right. Now, you know, and it's tough because obviously, you know, this was, it's a sensitive subject. Like if you lost someone in this, this tragedy, you know, who knows how you're going to feel about a legend such yeah. as the Mothman being attached to it. Yeah. For some, it might just be like whatever. You know, they're they're sad. You know, they're mourning the loss mm-hmm. of their loved ones. Some might take great offense, and, yeah. and that's that's understandable. It is difficult. Just so you know, we do understand that this is a you know lives were lost, and having this legend associated with it, some people probably find that offensive. But the town, likewise, has also embraced it. I'm sure you know the festival every year brings mm-hmm. in a lot of money for the town and everything. So. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult you know line to walk, but um, at the end of the day, yes, it's an awful awful tragedy. Yeah, because there are accounts of people saying that they saw the Mothman on top of just perched up on the bridge not long before it collapsed as well. Right. Yeah. So that's another thing that kind of draws people to the Mothman yeah. being involved in this somehow, and and it's true that after the bridge collapsed, there there was a drop off in this activity. It didn't stop, but there was a big drop off in all of the paranormal activity and the Mothman and and everything. And that's so fascinating. Yeah. Now, some people might argue that suddenly after real lives were lost in such a tragedy, maybe it it becomes less fun. Yeah. Chasing after this monster that, you know, so who knows? Or maybe if, if let's go with the idea that the Mothman was linked to this. Yeah, it would seem that his job, you know, he tried to warn people. Mm -hmm. And and, and now that the disaster has happened, he's, he's left. It's just interesting because you think that, like, how was Mothman trying to warn the people of Point Pleasant? Like, nothing that he did was in any sort of reference to the Silver Bridge. Exactly. So there's no way that people would, like, interpret his activity or just his presence as something having to do with a warning or the Silver Bridge or, or anything. Yeah. So I'm, I am I am confused by that, but like, I mean, a lot of people think that's what he was. A harbinger of doom is what they call him. Yeah. Meaning that he was aware and, and is kind of precludes it, but he did not commit this. It's not his fault. He didn't create the collapse. It almost makes me think of like, and maybe this is off base, but like uh, there's that moment when you read A Christmas Carol. Mm-hmm. When Scrooge sees Marley for the first time and they open the window and he can see all these souls with chains and whatnot. And there's one brief moment where there is a mother, he describes there's a mother freezing, she's holding her child, they're they're starving, they're cold, they're out in the cold, and that one of these ghosts is mourning that it can't help. Mm, it can't yeah. reach out. Yeah. And I get that sort of vibe. It's almost mm-hmm. like the Mothman in a way is cursed with having to be there for these things and wants to warn people, but can't. Yeah, yeah. I see that too, and especially because Linda, the woman that we have been quoting a lot during this this story, she said, you know, that she felt like the Mothman was trying to communicate with her. She got that feeling from it, mm. for whatever reason, that it wanted to say something, it wanted to communicate, but it just couldn't, it didn't know how. Yes, exactly. There's a lot of different theories about it, a lot of thoughts, but what is interesting is that a lot of the people that were involved in the case with John Keel, a lot of them died like recently after this this happened, not long after the Silver Bridge collapsed. Right. Apparently there was some divorces as well. These could all be coincidences, but it is just interesting that these people that were deeply attached to it, that they, you know, experienced great loss as well. Yes. Maybe that, that seemingly having nothing to do with it, but I don't know. It, it's 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 interesting because it's so easy to think that this was just I don't know, nothing, that it was just mass hysteria or it was something like that, that people were seeing things and everyone got convinced that there was something and whatever. But there's just so many sightings. I mean, Linda said that she knows personally 30 or 40 people that have seen the Mothman more than once. Wow. That's crazy. That's just people who have seen it more than once. Right. Imagine all the people that only saw it one time. Exactly. 
this thing seemed to affect people so deeply and for so long. I mean, people who were around at this time are, are still, many of them at least, are still so very interested in this case. And there is just so much about it. And I once again, I want to emphasize like the feeling of fear and just strangeness and, and weirdness that accompanies this. For example, Linda, once again, I, like I was just mentioning, the woman we've we've been, you know, mainly interacting with here. She was asked, is there anything about your experiences with this creature that you will never share with anyone, including me? And Linda said, yes. Okay. So this motherfucker's scary. Yeah. Weird. Uh and it could be many different things. Some people still claim that it's just a really big bird, like a crane, like a sandhill crane. That's that's the big thing that a lot of right. people say is that it was a sandhill crane that like got off course. It does have little red feathers around its eyes. It's very tall and, and it has a large wingspan. This does make sense, but it can't do everything that these people were saying. Yes. You know what's interesting? It makes me think, and I'm not going to say the name of the TV show because if what I say next, it would kind of spoil it. So I'm not going to say the name of the show. So if you end up watching it, you know, this way you won't know what I'm specifically talking about. But there mm -hmm. was this series we watched. It was really good. It was on Hulu. And throughout the whole series, there is this mysterious person. You don't know if he's demonic, if he's what he is, but bad things happen around him. Mm -hmm. People die. People all of a sudden will go into violent rages and kill each other in his presence. Well, in the end, you find out what he is, is he's actually a regular guy who somehow, somehow switched dimensions. So he was in a different version mm. of the town he lived in. Oh, and okay. just his mere presence, because he was not from that dimension, it causes mm. negative reactions, almost like when a virus enters your body, your white blood cells or whatever they go to work they attack yeah. him. it was or, almost like that I, like i said i'm not gonna say the name of the show so i don't spoil it because that's kind of the whole twist but in a way maybe it's something like that maybe the mothman is is or injured cold are are somehow interdimensional travelers and there's this effect if mm, you are yeah. in a dimension you don't belong there's this natural cosmic thing that happens almost like a virus like your yeah. your immune system and, and bad things happen around you not because you want them to happen but because you are emanating yeah. some sort of a thing that causes these, because you're not supposed to be there. It reminds me a lot of Inception when they, you know, you're supposed to get out of the dream, you know, within a certain amount of time because the people or whatever in the dream will realize you're not supposed to be there and come after you. Exactly. That's a great point I hadn't thought of. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like this thing is from somewhere not of our time and our environment is reacting to it. Who knows? I mean, that that is a great idea and theory, and I could definitely, yeah. I could see that. that. That makes sense to me. And even other than that, there are so many different explanations. You know, I'll just go over the, the ones that are, you know, quote unquote, the, the simple explanations. Maybe the, you know, Occam's razor explanations, R which I understand. It's good to be skeptical. Right, it's, you know, Occam's razor, as we know, simplified, of course, is essentially, you know, whatever the easiest explanation is, is probably the explanation. Whatever the right. simplest, most obvious thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, the sandhill crane. A lot of people think that makes sense. And if you do see a picture of a sandhill crane, like, standing with its wings all out, it can be, like, a lot. It can be scary. I mean, I grew up, there's tons of, Maureen has seen yeah. them when we visited my, my family out in the country in Michigan. There's tons of cranes, and there's must be a family that lives nearby because mm -hmm. they're always in the backyard. They're always hanging there, yeah. Especially in the morning, we'll usually wake up and there's a family of cranes. Yeah. You know, and they're tall. They are tall. I mean, oh, they're yeah. big birds, you know. Banshee goes after them. Yeah, so I don't know. But at the same time, you know, they don't look anything like what you would describe as Mothman. No. Now, who knows? Maybe someone could. Like we said, it doesn't have to be everything. Maybe there was a person who saw a crane right. and mistook it for something else. Mm -hmm. Sure. It doesn't mean everyone did right. that. Another explanation is an owl. There are a few different types of owls, but especially barred owls. Um, they, you know, we've talked about before in other episodes that owls have wild screeches that are scary. Um, that could have been those weird kind of screech chirping sounds that sometimes were, you know, attributed to the Mothman. Also wide wingspan. And then they have this, um, I forget what it's called right now, but it's like a film or something over their eyes that caused them to 
glow in the dark like cats have them and lots of other you know animals it, i don't know that that's something yeah and let us also not forget in our episode 114 the flatwoods monster that happened in the town of flatwoods west virginia in 1952 very similar to like a mothman many people thought an owl was was often tossed mm-hmm. around as as the explanation for that yeah that is another story that i forgot to mention in the last episode that is deeply tied to the mothman mythos that's episode 114 yeah. the flatwoods monster if you want to go check that out yeah they very are very much connected and some people think that the flatwoods monster and the mothman are the same yeah they so, sure do you never know you know, owls are, of course, they can be big, but not, you know, six feet tall or seven feet tall or whatever. But a lot of people have mentioned that, you know, it's really hard to see or understand how, the, how large something is when it's moving quickly. You can, it can seem like it's a lot bigger than it actually is, especially like with headlights, possibly. Like it, it can, the shadow can make the thing seem much bigger than it actually is. Sure. That's a thought. This is a little bit more of a, maybe a little bit more of an out there, quote unquote, thought, but still maybe more reasonable, possibly, depending on who you ask. And that is maybe the mutation from the TNT area or the power plant has something to do with this. Classic superhero tale. Right, exactly. Now, as far as I know, I, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but I, I do think that mutation, it does happen with environmental waste. Uh, but I think the results usually are is just death or injury to the animal that ha- has been affected by the the you know mutation and that and that is how it you know affects animals you know instantly or immediately and then what really happens is that it affects the you know the genes of their offspring right so that their offspring are some kind of something that they're different but you know what I wonder there is that like so what would be the original animal that mutated into Mothman. Like, this seems pretty intense. Absolutely, like, good point. That's a lot, that's a big leap for a bat to mutate into that. You exactly, know? right. I don't know, it would, or it's, it's just hard to think about, but you know, also, I literally haven't studied genetics or biology since Bush was president, so I'm not, you know, a scientist. For sure, but that's for my sure. understanding of, the, of what's going on there. Nor am I, but I think the citizens here, the citizens of the Milky Way know that, you know, we don't, we don't pretend to be experts in any no. sort of field so now here are some connections to what whatever you want to call it folklore or beings from other cultures or or things like that now appalachia is very much influenced by the irish and the scottish so a lot of people have compared the mothman to banshees yes in the way that it foretells a tragedy or mm-hmm. something that's a great point oftentimes has red eyes can make a you know scary noise so it's it, even if it's not exactly the same it, it kind of does a similar thing so it makes you think like okay maybe was that kind of brought over from there the, the thought process of it and it really just took off from there right there also is this being from India I believe called the Garuda and it is a dark flying being that foretells disaster. Wow. So that's very interesting. I don't think there were many Indian, meaning like people from India, people living in Appalachia at the time, but I could be wrong, but I don't think so. So that's interesting. It's like, I wonder how that folklore would have just come over here. Yeah, that's interesting. And obviously we know that around the world, part of what makes this so beautiful is we see all these different legends that are essentially saying the same thing. It's just with their own cultural coat of paint and right. it's it's which is part of what makes this show so fun and, and so wonderful to do is we see you know it's it's the things we're scared of that brings us together and right. um yeah that is interesting that that would make it here and i don't know perhaps there was indian influence in in the area i i, I don't don't have an expert knowledge yeah, of i'm it, not but sure I, but yeah or also maybe it's we're all seeing the same thing but it just it all looks different in each area depending on the whatever right. the many different as you know you know variables and then also we maybe understand or view it in a certain way that's different from people around the world because of their experiences or or whatever now there is also the thought about interdimensional beings yes this is a a lot of people think this and it it does seem to make probably the most quote unquote sense 
I think. And it, the, a term that Keel, I don't know if he necessarily coined it, but a term he threw around a lot and really kind of introduced to the zeitgeist was the term ultra terrestrial. The idea of these beings that rather than coming from other planets or whatnot are traveling through dimensions. Yes. Yeah. And that's also, you know, a lot of people are are really starting to take that more seriously even today with the, you know, the UFOs that we are, you know, or, or UAPs or whatever you want to call them yeah. that are being seen and documented and reported now. Well, I think the fact that just a few years ago they were able to prove the existence of gravitational waves, mm-hmm. uh, which essentially, and once again, I am not an expert. And so I don't, I don't really have a, a vocabulary to properly explain it, but essentially these are ripples, waves and gravity, essentially waves in time. The idea, and this is not something new. This is something that's been talked about in years. Is essentially mm-hmm. you to travel a grand distance rather than needing a, a an awesome fuel or right. light speed. You essentially are bending the fabric of space and time. Yeah. So this distance that is like light years away suddenly becomes close because right. you are literally opening up the ripple of time and walking through, essentially in a, in a way. And there's also theories that maybe some of these crafts we're seeing now the way they operate and how they'll sometimes blip into view and blip out of view is they are literally shooting through layers of space and time right right it's so interesting and it's it sounds so like fantastical and just kind of like sci-fi e but it's like that's i mean that's yeah pretty legit like a lot of legit people are you know that's a real thought so there's been talks of lots of other interdimensional beings you know like Bigfoot, some people think is an interdimensional being. Um, And then also a lot of interdimensional beings possibly in, especially Appalachia in general, like like the uh, the Kelly Hopkinsville goblins or the, the the encounter there, we've covered it in a past story that mm-hmm. that relates to this as well. Uh, you know, and that's the thing about this mythos is if you really want to, you could really connect almost anything. So then it becomes a matter of well, what is actually a, a you know a connection that really makes sense mm-hmm. and is probable because you, really you could almost make connections to everything. Right. Right. It's just interesting because also a lot of people think that caves maybe can connect you or, or transport you possibly through other dimensions. And a lot, there were caves behind the TNT area. And the, a lot of people thought that that's actually where Mothman was living or coming from was those caves rather than the actual TNT area. Right. There's something there. In the last episode, we even mentioned about miners seeing shit and experiencing shit. Yes. Uh, we talk, We we brought up an old episode. We did the Van Meter Visitor, this winged creature that would emerge mm-hmm. from this mine at night. And yeah. many people saw it. They shot it a lot, and yeah. it just kept going. And uh, essentially, Keel's grand thesis through all of his work was that he came to the conclusion that this was all connected. Yeah. Uh, Because when he was studying the UFO phenomenon, he started to realize that in the periphery and in the proximity of these experiences, people were also experiencing weird poltergeist activity or these men in black, these things that seem unrelated, but why are they happening around the same time as these experiences? So yeah, and his grand thesis was that somehow these are all connected, that this is something that connects all of us in a way. I mean, periods included. Uh, Periods included. We found that out last episode. That, and that's the other thing where I'm like, are we like including periods and thinking there's some like fucking paranormal activity? Like let's not, but also maybe, you know, like we said, there, there could be reasons for why it would be connected. You know? Right. Who in knows? Some cases, who knows? You never know. And to a degree, I do believe that, and a lot of people, you know, kind of believe this too, is that we are capable to a degree, at least, of creating our own reality or psychical experience. Sometimes I do think that things are just kind of your mind tricking you. Like like I, I think I mentioned last episode where it's like, you know, your brain wants to find patterns and you have something on your mind and you see something that might complete that pattern and then you, you're, you're tricked into thinking you saw something that wasn't there. Right. That is possible, of course. But I also think sometimes our minds are much more powerful than we give them credit for. And that maybe we are able to connect with these things either with Without our control or maybe with practice, we, we can control it more. Yeah. And according to Keel, he says that, quote, About 10% of the population have the ability to see above and beyond the narrow spectrum of visible light. They can see radiations and even objects invisible to the rest of us. There you have it. And, you know, I'm not sure where Keel is getting that information from, but it, it did remind me of something. 
and it is the idea of highly sensitive people. And this is actually a real thing. This isn't just some kind of like, you know, woo woo thing. This was, I read this, sources from Berkeley as well as the Cleveland Clinic. Those are very, you know, respectable, reputable sources. I read about it in many other places. I have a book on it. And I, according to what I've looked into and tests I've, you know, taken online and looked into, I am one. I am a highly sensitive person. And I think, Dylan, you probably are too. And what that basically means is by being a highly sensitive person that maybe you, you know, like have these abilities that could be affected in order for you to see or experience the Mothman. Right. And highly sensitive people, it is a thing, like I said, and it's not like a uh, something that means you're sensitive to aliens or whatever like that. I'm just saying that maybe it's like that. Highly sensitive people, you know, are pretty much exactly what they're called. They're highly sensitive. They are highly empathetic, deeply emotional, very in tune with animals, very uh, great with animals, in tune and affected by those around them. And also not just the people that they're with, but the actual environment that they're in as well. Highly sensitive people process information of their surroundings more deeply and feel it more deeply and therefore can kind of connect more dots and find patterns that maybe other people can't. So maybe highly sensitive people are able to see the Mothman when others can't because of their sensitivity. But at the same time, maybe because of their sensitivities, they mistakenly think they see the Mothman when really it was nothing or something else, but it's just only natural for them to think it was the Mothman because it's everywhere. Yes. And so it's it makes sense that they would think that they would see it. Right, right. So I just think that's interesting that there is this, you know, highly sensitive people. It's a real thing. For sure. And so that it could, I don't know, there could be something there. And I'm sure many of you know, and I'm, but I'm sure many of you don't know that the Mothman has been seen all over the world yes. since 1966 and 1967 in West Virginia. Yes. A lot of people think that the Mothman was in Chernobyl before the disaster there, the nuclear power plant disaster. Right. Some people think he was there before 9-11. Mm-hmm. And there was actually a big, big flap of Mothman sightings in Chicago. Yes, right here in Chicago, all over the place. All over Chicago, mainly at O'Hare International Airport. And it's funny because even though that lasted for a few years, the bulk, like where it was really heavy, was during the summer of 2017, while you and I met each other Mm -hmm. working on a cruise ship. We weren't in town. We weren't here, yeah. Which is kind of funny. Maybe he was warning the town that these two were getting together. Oh, oh, brother. And, you know, like you mentioned Chernobyl, uh, the Blackbird of Chernobyl, Mm -hmm. that might be related. That might be an episode in the future. If I'm going to look into it and and, uh, because I know that's a, a legend that people really are fascinated by and, you know, if it's there's enough there we'll we'll make it into an episode as well but um yeah yeah. absolutely and we we have a great list of accounts and stories of the mothman in chicago yes and we are going to save that for our patreon this month as well we have some great stories and we'll go into more detail about chernobyl and 9-11 involving the mothman as well and of course there is so much more to this mothman case There are so many other interesting encounters with Mothman himself or with Men in Black or with other weird things. Other great stories of people seeing crafts and balls of light and planes that turn into UFOs and UFOs that turn into regular looking airplanes. And I mean, so much stuff. It's just I couldn't fit it all in this episode or else this episode would be 50 years long. Right. Well, this is also what we wanted to do was cover the core story. Yes. I'm sure we will come back to more specific parts, of course, but if there is any, you know, part of this mythos, of this legend, of this story that you love that we didn't get to, please reach out to us on our socials or email us at creepstreetpodcast at gmail.com, and we will definitely mention it on a future episode and um, keep giving the information out there. But I think to really encapsulate the whole feeling of this experience... I think uh, John Keel did a good job uh, putting it into words here. Out there in the night, those puzzling spheres of light still ply their ancient routes 
in the Mississippi and Ohio valleys. A new generation of young people stand on the hilltops, expectantly scanning the skies, their elders jaded by nearly 30 years of signs and wonders, no longer scoff. Believers in extraterrestrial visitants and saviors from outer space are now welcomed on the most respectable television shows to broadcast their propaganda for that imaginary world with its superior technology and its marvelous stupid representatives who adopt the names of ancient gods and moan they are prisoners of time. People ask me still if I know what the future holds, but just as I used Socratic irony in my investigations, I can only admit, like Socrates, that the more I learn, the less I know. My glimpses of the future were all secondhand and were frequently garbled by accident or design. After spending a lifetime in Egyptian tombs, among the crumbling temples of India and the lamistries of the Himalayas, endless nights in cemeteries, gravel pits, and hilltops everywhere, I have seen much and my childish sense of wonder remains unshaken. But Charles Fort's question always haunts me. If there is a universal mind, must it be sane? Wow. Maureen, thank you so much for doing all of that incredible research. Oh my gosh, it really was a pleasure. I am so happy to do it and to finally get the Mothman mythos out there on Creep Street. Amen. And it's something we will always be referencing back to, yeah. uh, uh, learning more about as we go along. And uh, once again, just thank you to everybody for, for listening and, and whatnot. This was this was truly a, uh, a goal we had had. And, oh, and yeah. we reached it together and because of your help as well. So We're so excited. We're so excited. But I do wonder, like, sometimes do you ever wonder if there's like a list of names that you would like love to go on a spacecraft with to Lanulos? Funny you should mention that, Maureen, because I got a list of names I wouldn't mind riding first class to Lanulos with. Give it on up for our top tier Patreon subscribers. Of course, the Dream James Watkins, the Finnish Face via Lungfist, the Madman Marcus Hall, the Vivacious Vicky McHugh, the Tenacious Teresa Hackworth, the Heartbreak Kid Chris Hackworth, the Oso Suave Sean Richardson, the British Bone Breaker Bex Martin, the Notorious Nicholas Barker, the Terrifying Taylor Lashmet, the Count of Cool Cameron Corliss, the Archduke of Attitude Adam Archer, the Sinister Sam Kiker, the Nightmare of New Zealand Noeline Vivilli, the Loathsome Johnny Love, the Carnivorous Kevin Bogey, the Killer Stud Carl Staub, the Firestarter Heather Carter, the Conqueror Christopher. Damien Damaris, the awfully awesome Annie, the murderous Maggie Leach, the sir of sexy Sam Hackworth, the evil Elizabeth Riley, Lauren Hellfire, Hernandez Lopez, the maniacal Laura Maynard, the vicious Karen Van Buren, the arch nemesis Aaron Bird, the sadistic Sergio Castillo, the rap scallion Ryan Crumb, the beast Benjamin Huang, the devilish Chris Doucette, the psycho Sam, the electric Emily Zhang, the renegade Corey Ramos, the crazed Carlos, the antagonist Andrew Park, the monstrous Michaela Schur, the witchy wonder J.P. Weimer, the freaky Ben Ford, Forsyth, the barbaric Andrew Barry, and the mysterious Marcella. Thank you so much, Dylan, for reading those names. And thank you so very much to our top tier Patreon subscribers. We are so grateful for you. And of course, thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers. No matter the tier, you're all great. And thank you so much to all of you for listening. You have been fantastic. We love you so much. But I think it's time now for me to reveal a little something. Say what? I think it's time for me to reveal the first book of the Creep Street Book Club. Let's hear it, folks. Now, there's going to be all sorts of genres in the Creep Street Book Club. Yes. We're going to cover so many topics as well as genres. So if, don't feel like you need to read every single book. If this one isn't for you, don't worry. It's not always going to be like this. And if this one is for you, get excited because we're also going to be reading other things. Yeah. Now, the book that we will be discussing at the end of October is called I'm in Love with Mothman by Paige Lavoie. Wow, sounds steamy. Yes, I thought it was appropriate. We got to read a love story with Mothman. Like, I'm picking up these vibes. Absolutely, I would love to hear it. I'm excited. Feel free to pick it up at any, you know, your local bookstore or Amazon if you got to, or Kindle it, or listen to it if that's an option. I don't know if it is, but yes, I'm in love with Mothman. It's the first in a, a series 
you know, who knows if we'll read the whole series, but we're going to read the first one at least. And we'll be discussing that, um, you know, end of October. Can't wait to listen. And uh, once again, as you're listening, please email or uh, DM any uh, questions or or topics of conversation you want to talk about or thoughts. uh, And I will uh, share them and discuss them on the episode. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. Good night. And goodbye. Goodbye.